General Manager of the Health Center. My name is Mike Pleasure to welcome you this evening to our LC Selection Series. I'm to see you this but I'd like to touch on a few points before that. The Latino Cultural Center is actually a division of the City of Dallas' Office of Cultural Affairs. The Latino Cultural Center is actually a division of the City of Dallas' Office of Cultural Affairs. The Latino Cultural Center is actually a division of the City of Dallas' Office of Cultural Affairs. With us we have tonight um, several elected officials, and I'd like to acknowledge those we have tonight. Uh, first and foremost, I'm just Mayor uh, Pro Tem Pauline Medrano is here with us. Mayor Pro Tem, thank you so much for being here. With us tonight also is Council Member District 6, Tony Dunn Wilson. With us tonight also is Chan, thank you so much. And State Representative Robert Ramon is also with us. And State Representative also with us this evening is uh, the Public Art Committee Chairman Paul Rich. He's the State Donor Public Affairs Commission. Thank you for being here. And the Cultural Affairs Commissioner Dr. Carol Ripley. And the Cultural Affairs Commissioner Dr. Carol Ripley. Okay, really quick, because I know we're running a little bit behind. The Latino Public Commission of Real Quick serves as a regional catalyst for the preservation, promotion, and development of Latino and Hispanic arts and culture. As such, we're very proud to have Luis Valdez this evening. But first, I'd also like to give a quick shout out to everyone here for the TCG conference. Thank you. I hope you're enjoying Dallas. It's a great place to live. We're halfway between New York and LA, so don't forget that. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Luis Valdez and the moder his moderator, Jose Luis Torres. Thank you so much. My name is Jose Luis Torres, I'm the manager of the Public Information Office with the City of Dallas and the Department of Aviation with the City. Tonight it is my pleasure to have someone whom I met several in this, well, let's see, in the early 70s. Uh, he was a real young man and at the time he was being named as the father of Chicano theater. But I just saw him again after many years and I think he's the grandfather of Chicano theater. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome. Big, nice Dallas welcome to Mr. Luis Valdez. Thank you. Tonight is a, is a very special night because we have uh, a theater conference and we have a lot of uh, people that are interested in knowing about <coughs> Chicano theater and uh, who else to tell us about Chicano theater than Mr. Luis Valdez, the creator of uh, Teatro Campesino and, like I said, the father, is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> the grandfather of Chicano theater. But anyways, um, in 1965, uh, Luis started Teatro Campesino, and you can tell us a little bit about the history. A lot of people today are very interested in knowing about um, Sut Sut and La Bamba. We'll talk about that, but first, Luis, tell us a little bit about how Teatro Chicano was born. It was a real challenge for me, so I majored in English, changed my major to English with an emphasis on playwriting, began to write my first plays. I learned about the 1930s. And I consider myself to be an offshoot, really, of the, of the theater of the 1930s. My uh, inspiration was the Federal Theater Project, Alec Flanagan. My inspiration, uh, John Howard Lawson, Broadway playwright, founder of the Writers Guild in Hollywood, uh, William Soroyan. These two playwrights saw my first play, The Shrung Head of Pancho Villa, San Jose State. And so they kind of baptized me, <laughs> you know. They embraced me, and I felt the embrace of the 1930s uh, generation. Later, I met Harold Kurman, leader of the group theater, and, and he also embraced me as a playwright. So really, I feel I'm an extension of American theater of the 1930s. So those playwrights that wrote socially oriented drama, Clifford Odette's Waiting for Lefty, inspired me. And I thought that the theater could be activist. And so combining my farm worker roots with, with my education, I conceived of this thing called uh, a farm workers theater. It's just a generic name, a farm workers theater. It's Teatro Campesino. And the opportunity to make it a reality came when, when I met Cesar Chavez. It was at the beginning of the later grape strike. 
And I went to him and I pitched him an idea for a theater of by and for farm workers. And the first thing he said was, well, you know, there's no money to do theater in Delano. <laughs> there are no actors in Delano. There's no stage in Delano. There's no time to rehearse. No place to rehearse. We're on strike, day and night. Do you still want to do it? And I said, absolutely, Caesar. What an opportunity, you know. <laughs> The opportunity came, as he, he was absolutely right, the opportunity came on the picket line. So it was on the picket line that Teatro Campesino was born as an activist act, trying to get the scabs out of the fields. Nonviolent strike, so we had to convince them. So we used to climb on top of cars and trucks in order to get them out of the fields. Later on, we began to perform the Friday night meetings, putting together what I, I called actors. I didn't want to call them skids. We weren't Boy Scouts, you know. Uh, but you, so we, I, I wanted something that could name what we were doing. So I had to name it. An acto is an act, you know, it seemed to be a political act as well as a theatrical act. And it seemed to me that was the right thing to do. And so uh, I should say that I went back to the place where I was born. I was born in Delano. I met Cesar Chavez when I was six years old. So it was the coming home in every way. But Delano was transformed. Delano was a lot like, uh, like the South Valley here in Texas. It was a lot like uh, the South. 1965 it was segregated, that's where I grew up, segregated schools, segregated movie theaters, and not much respect for people of Mexican descent or any people of color. So it was really a cry from the gut to do this theater, and since it was that kind of a political act, it, it ran into the kind of opposition that you might expect. And one day out on the picket line, a grower's son confronted me, pulled out a gun and put it to my head when we were acting. And he said, okay, act. And I almost did, I almost acted in my pants, you know what I mean? But, uh, <laughs> but the fact is that I had, at that moment, at that split second, I said, is what I'm doing worth dying for? And I decided that it was, that I was gonna to continue to do what I was doing. And that, that there was no way that I was going to stop. And so, you hear about dying on the theater, I almost literally died. You know? <laughs> but uh, there are ways to live, there are ways to go ahead. And uh, I remain committed to the idea of theater of by and for farm workers because there's still a farm worker situation. Uh, Cesar Chavez has been dead for 20 years and campesinos are still getting exploited in the fields. They move up, they move to the cities. They, they get other jobs and the children get educated and I'm very grateful that that takes place. But there's still more campesinos coming in as beasts of burden and uh, so there's still a need for a teatro campesino and uh, we're still there. Uh, we're still in San Juan Bautista where we've been for 42 years in the mouth of the Salinas Valley. We continue to work with farm worker youth. They're coming to us now from deep indigenous Mexico where we used to get people from northern Mexico and from Texas and different places. We now get people from Oaxaca, we now get people from Chiapas, we now get people coming and speak, they can't even speak Spanish, they're so indigenous. They come speaking Mixteco, they come speaking Triqui, there are other languages. And so it's a real challenge for us. Theater is one of the most direct ways for us to continue to, uh, to communicate and essentially bring them out. It's their children, really, that we're dealing with. So it's a long story, but I, I hope I've answered it. Okay, your well, question. <laughs> yes. Yes. The pilgrims in uh, Plymouth Rock claim that um, the first theater presentation in the United States was made by them uh, to the Indians. However, we know better. <laughs> yeah, the very first theater done in what is now the United States was done on the banks of the Rio Grande, the Rio Bravo in 1598. In my hometown, El Paso. <laughs> it was under the leadership of Juan de Oñate. He's the son of a conquistador. He was married to the granddaughter of Hernán Cortés and Moctezuma, El Huicamina. So he was lined up, you know. He had a few peccadillos himself. He was, he was also <laughs> a conquistador, you know, and he, he, he raised some hell over here in New Mexico but he was a settler of New Mexico. But what they did is they performed, they had a whole contingent 
600 families coming uh, from Mexico, Guadalajara to Zacatecas uh, to colonize what is now the Southwest, what is now New Mexico. And so they performed uh, Los Moros y Los Cristianos. That was most recently, last year, I was, uh, my wife and I, Lupe, were, were in um, Zacatecas, and we were guests at the Moriscada. I don't have, have you ever been at the Moriscada? How many of you? Okay, there you go, one percent. The Moriscada is performed on mountains. Literally, it is the struggle between los moros y los cristianos. The moors, not to say Islam, uh, and the Muslims, and the Christians, because America was settled by the Spanish in 1492, exactly at the time that the Spanish were fighting the Arabs in Spain. And the memory of that historical moment is preserved in Los Moros y Los Cristianos. I have, been, I have seen the Moro Moro in Manila, the Philippines, and it is the Filipino version of the same play, Los Moros y Los Cristianos. I went there under the aegis of the International Theater Institute, by the way, 1971, which is my first contact with people that became TCG, before TCG came into existence. But the thing is that Los Moros y Los Cristianos is this gigantic play, it's so huge, that in Mexico they continue to perform it on mountains. Hundreds of people are, are involved. And you stand on one mountain and you see the soldiers scaling this other mountain. They wear costumes that are down to the last little details. They've got the little knapsacks, they've got the fireplaces. And it's so huge, as a matter of fact, that there was a carnival right, on, on another hill. And, and people had their, were camped out there because these are poor campesinos, so they come and they camp out. So anyway, this is the play that Juan de Oñate, probably on a smaller scale, performed with his, his contingent of people on horseback on the banks of the Rio Grande in 1598 the first theater in what is now the continental United States. You may not know that, but now you know that. <laughs> Actually, I was told it was on or about April 30th, 1598, you're right. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Luis, uh, um, you are famous for uh, many things, in my view, but one of the ones that uh, Americans, uh, or people in the United States, theater goers, uh, know you for is uh, Sutsu, which made uh, James Taylor almost a, a mega star, and uh, La Bamba, which uh, still resonates in my mind, the music of La Bamba. Tell us a little bit about Sutsu and La Bamba. Well, Sutsu, uh, yeah, I can connect them too, actually. Sutsu uh, is about a historical event that they're celebrating this year, the 70th anniversary of the Zutsu riots in, in, in Los Angeles. And actually, it, when I wrote the play, and when we staged it at the Mark Day Perform in Los Angeles in 1978, it had been 35 years since the events of the Zutsu riots. It has now been 35 years since Zutsu, the play, premiered. So we're really, you know, the history marches on. But it, uh, I would became very aware that, that the memory of, of the Zutsu riots and the, the events of World War II was still like a, a, a sore place in, in the public consciousness in the, in the city of Los Angeles. It was like a wound that had never completely healed. And there were still people that were, uh, and again, not just Latinos, not just Chicanos, but Anglos, you know, that felt that, that, that horrendous event. Nobody was killed during the Zutu riots of 1943, not in Los Angeles anyway, the Zutu riots spread east and west, and south rather. So Beaumont, Texas saw Zutu riots here. And eventually it got to Harlem where five, five African Americans were killed in the streets and there were $5 million worth of damage. It was incredible in 1943. So there, there was a violent result, but the one in Los Angeles didn't kill anybody, but it injured people psychically. And I think it injured the city psychically. And again, the only way to expiate that sin, that collective sin, the only way to begin to deal to heal it was, was to have a collective ritual. And this is where the theater, someone was talking about the importance of live theater uh, this morning. And it is because we need it as a society, as any society, in order to 
heal ourselves, sometimes from collective wounds, and the Zutu riot was one of them. And of course, slavery is another, the incarceration of the Japanese in World War II is another, you know, there's a list, there's a whole list. The treatment of gays, so I mean, it's a list. The treatment of women in general, I mean, that's a whole list. That's a book, actually. <laughs> but, but the thing is that you expiate and you, you exercise through the theater, and so, I was invited to write a play by Gordon Davidson of the Mark Daper Forum. He discovered us when Peter Brook and his company, the International Center for Theater Research, came from Paris to spend the summer with us at El Teatro Campesino in 1973. Now, people have known that Peter Brook was in the United States in 1973. He spent a month elsewhere. But of the three months that he spent in the United States with his company, two of those were in San Juan Bautista. And, and uh, a number of people were there. I mean, it's a wonderful exchange that we had, an incredible, memorable exchange. Uh, there was a young blonde in her early 20s called Helen Mirren. She was part of that, that company. And they were in San Juan Bautista. Helen Mirren has an in la cage, cuatro uh, movimiento, Nawi Olin tattoo that she had made before she left San Juan Bautista. And she still has it. In order to play the Queen of England, she has to put makeup on it. You know, she still has it. She occasionally shows it on television. You, know, you may have seen it. But in any way, it, it, was, it was a tremendously uh, moving experience for us. And, and we went to Los Angeles, to Santa Barbara, and that's where I met Gordon Davidson. And so he invited the theater to come perform the next season. We, we did 10 days at the Mark David Forum. And then eventually he approached me to do a play about Los Angeles history. They were starting a whole new series and starting to work with people of color. And this is where Gordon Davidson really became a pioneer is that he reached out to other people in the Los Angeles community. And I was one of the first. And so he said, uh, are you willing to write a play for the New Theater for Now series? And, and of course, eventually directed. And so I, I agreed. And we almost simultaneously agreed that the Zoot Suit riots were perfect, and that the Sleep Lagoon case, which had happened the year before, was really the kickoff. And so I wrote uh, an early version of Zoot Suit, which we staged in the spring of 1978. It was announced in a little tiny paragraph in the LA Times. I guess what impressed them is that the first 10 day run of Baby Zoot, as we called it, in the spring, sold out before it opened. <laughs> you know? uh, all the tickets were sold. And so the box office said, hey, what's happening here? You know? And so uh, we had a good run. It was just a play in evolution. And, uh, but what really struck us all was that not only were people eager to see the play, they were desperate to see the play because of the psychic wound, because Chicanos needed to see themselves at the music center, because people that had seen the Zoot Suit riots happen and the Sleepy Lagoon case happen needed to see what I had to say about it. And, and the fact is that uh, that excitement, that excitement really created a fire, a firestorm in Los Angeles. So uh, I was invited to rewrite the play, which I did, and, uh, and to become the first uh, offering of that 78 fall season, 78, 79. And again, they announced the eight week run, and before they even opened, the whole eight week run sold out. It was completely sold out. So people obviously said, what the is going on here? You know, hey, what is this? And so we couldn't close the play, so, uh, we found the old Aquarius Theater where, where Hare had played last in Hollywood. And uh, their taper staff refurbished it and we opened and stayed there for 11 months. Eventually then Zoot Suit ran for a full year. Close to a half a million people saw it. Half a million people. It made enough money for the taper to purchase the Aquarius. E, Master of Ceremonies, Zoot Suiter. And he got out, and it was very brave, he got out in the middle of these two gangs in character. <laughs> and he stopped it, which was amazing. After that, we were very careful which gang was coming to the show, you see. <laughs> but the fact is, it wasn't just gangs, it was grandmothers, it was grandfathers, it was, you know, and, and not just Chicanos. I mean, we had everybody in the city. Finally, the city of Los Angeles was seeing itself, not only on the stage, but also uh, in the audience. The theater was happening in the audience. 
And, uh, you know, I wanted, uh, it was interracial in the sense that we had Anglo, we had Chicanos, we had uh, African Americans. It was very important. The legacy, again, of the Zoot Suit and all that swing music, all that jazz goes back to the African American community. Very important. And I also needed to have some reflection of, of the war. So we had uh, one Asian American dancer, Kim Miori, who had worked with Pat Birch, our choreographer, dancing with a sailor, and they became World War II. Uh, the Kim Miori in Japanese accented costumings, and then this sailor in a white uniform dancing downstage as a light motif of the war, you know, in, interweaving with the action. Um, the play itself is an offshoot of the work of El Teatro Campesino. I could not have arrived in 1978 with a play that did not have that influence because the teatro had already been into existence for 13 years. You know, but we had cut our eye keys. I, I, I got a degree in English and in playwriting. I mean, that, that San Jose State in 1964. And then I went up to San Francisco to work with the San Francisco Mind Troupe, which was also a wonderful year. Uh, I joined a cultural revolution in San Francisco. Uh, I became a hippie, <laughs> you know. But, but the fact is that, that it was those years with the Teatro Campesino on flatbed trucks with no lighting whatsoever except general lighting, in some cases headlights from cars, and confronting an audience that that was in need of something, not just there to be entertained, but in need of a statement. That fed Zoot Suit eventually. And I was able to construct um, the events of, of the Zoot Suit uh, riots and of the Sleepy Lagoon case into a play that is epic. I'm Breckian in spirit. I adopted Bertolt Brecht as my, uh, my ancestor, you know. <laughs> my artistic ancestor a long time ago. And so it's an epic play in the sense that it's got many levels and it's historical in nature. And in as far as the Teatro Campesino is concerned, we've gone through an evolution in the last 48 years. We started with the Actos. We developed mythos. Those are myths. Actos are adjectives, you know. Mythos are, are, myth, are, are mythical, <coughs> mythical actos, short pieces that deal, or they're long pieces deal with mythology. Corridos, that deal, there are music that are already existent in Mexican culture, but we set them to the stage. We set them up and dramatize these corridos, because they have dialogue, they have music, and so there's a musicalized form of theater. And then finally, uh, since Zoot Zoot, historias, histories. I think it's really important that, uh, to acknowledge the role of the theater in the creation and recreation of history. Not just with Shakespeare, and, 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 and not just with the Chikomatsu Mozaimon in, in Japan, but also more, I mean, all kinds of playwrights that have come along that have captured an era. And so history has become really important, and so Zutsu is an historia. Zutsu is an epic play that deals with a chunk of history. My latest play, Ballet of the Heart, is also an historia. It, it's, I just finished writing it, we're casting it now. It'll be performed uh, in August, September of this year at the Teatro Campesino in our first production of it, a workshop production. But it deals with Japanese Americans and Mexican Americans. And it's an opportunity for me to look in a different mirror, to see my face, not just my Mexican face, but my <coughs> Japanese face. And, and, and I've been trying to do that all along, you know, through my works. I think Zoot Suit was an opportunity for me to see my African-American face. And, and I think that uh, even though we have vast problems in our prisons today, where you have mostly Latinos and African-Americans incarcerated as, uh, as victims of a system that's trying to profit off of their incarceration, of their animalization, uh, nevertheless, uh, we have cross-cultured influenced each other for many, many generations. And so Zoot Suit was born out of cultural fusion. Fusion with, uh, between Chicanos and African Americans and the Jewish kids and the Irish kids and the Asian kids that, that took to swing and put on Zoot Suit. A lot, <clears throat> there is a... There is a lot of us who are baby boomers and a little earlier too and, and, and thereabouts and 
like my wife can attest, uh, there is a phrase in American culture that brings a lot of memories. It's the day the music died. Why Ricardo Valenzuela? Well, because he was there, for one. Uh, I, I, let me just say that this happened. Uh, when we were opening Zoot Suit on Broadway at the Winter Garden Theater, you know, the last place I expected to land was the Winter Garden Theater on Broadway. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was, I was telling Teresa Eyring uh, earlier today that uh, I was on the board of TCG in 1974. My son, Kinan, mentioned uh, today that Peter Zeisler had invited me to join TCG. And I said, why should I join TCG when TCG has not joined me? You know, I mean, why, why should I deal with the American theater when the American theater uh, doesn't even acknowledge me as a bastard child? You know, what? I don't have anything to do with American theater. And he said, well, it never will, you know, unless you, you participate. And so I, I took him at his word. I liked him. I liked him a lot. And so I, I, I not only joined TCG, I was on the board. And Hal Prince was the president of the board at TCG when I joined. Stephen Sondheim was our vice president. So I went to my first meeting of the board in New York City on Broadway, some office building, and I had my opportunity to speak. And now a new board member, you know? So I stood up and I knew who they were. They didn't know who I was, but I knew who they were. So I said, you know, America needs to acknowledge its Latinos. I was saying, I'm here, I don't wanna be here, but I'm here because I need to be here. I said, we need a voice and we need to be part of this organization. We need to have our voice heard on Broadway as much as anywhere else. And, uh, but throughout the whole country, and, and we're part of the American theater. My objective is to build, to try to help build a new wing of the American theater that involves uh, people of Hispanic descent, or Chicanos and Latinos. And they all listened to you like this. And when I was finished, they all went back to talking about their business. <laughs> and so it was an interesting moment. I never had one word of conversation, you know, with Hal or, or, or with Stephen. Uh, about what I had said, which was a little odd. I mean, I respected them. But I understood it as a sign of the times. Uh, that was quite a while ago. That was in 1974. And then uh, I, I went to a meeting called the First American Congress of the Theater, the FACT Conference, at Princeton University. And everybody from the American Theater was there. I mean, Julian Beck, uh, Joe Chaikin, uh, Jane Alexander, I mean, everybody was there, you know, all the, the heavies, everybody, including, including uh, uh, David Merrick, you know, I mean, people like that, the, the huge producers from Broadway. The main problem there was how do we say Broadway? That was the question. And again, it was very frustrating for me. And so I got into a, a conversation with Joe Papp, the, the founder of the Public Theater, and uh, in the hallway that was eventually joined by Bernie Jacobs and Jerry Schoenfield. The Schuberts, I don't know if you know any of these names or what do they mean to you, but anyway, they were in the hallway, and then, and then Jane Alexander, and it what was a very spirited discussion, almost evolved almost into an argument. And I was, I'm, I was a bad guy, you know, I was the one that was, I was, I was the iconoclast, I was, I was the smart ass, I was the kid, you know. And, and I was saying that, the, I don't care if Broadway dies, I said, let it die. It has no value to me, why should I care? And they would say, but it is important for you. And I said, nah, you know. Anyway, this went on. Eventually, Jane got us all together. You know, we, no, nobody made enemies. You know, we parted friends and stuff. But it was very spirited, very passionate discussion. 1974, five years later, almost to the day, opening night on Broadway, I'm backstage, Bernie Jacobs, one of our producers, and of course, they had the Winter Garden, they owned the Winter Garden. Comes up to me backstage and he says, the role of Henry uh, Reyna in Zoot Zoot. We're up in his dressing room, second floor, overlooking 7th Avenue. And, and we're feeling good about ourselves, we're feeling nervous, but great to be there. And he's dressing and I'm dressing and, 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 and we kind of look at each other and say, uh, man, this is great. We've done the 40s. What are we going to do next? We've got to do the 50s. And we've got to come back to New York on Broadway with the 50s. But what can we do to capture the 50s? And that exact moment, 
when the door was open, we heard mariachi music coming from down below. And we looked out the window and down on 7th Avenue there were mariachis and they were playing and I looked at my brother, La Bamba! <laughs> the president of Mexico had sent mariachis to serenade us on opening night on Broadway. And so La Bamba, so my brother after that for the next five years went looking for the family, went looking for details, story, um, so we could do this musical on Broadway. It became a movie instead. <laughs> it became uh, my feature, you know, the, the La Bamba, our feature, you know. Uh, we tracked down uh, the family of Richie Valens. He kept looking for them all over Los Angeles, which is, you know, a couple of hundred miles away from San Juan. But they were next door in Watsonville, you know, <laughs> they were in the next town over. And, uh, and so we connected with them and eventually it became a movie. I would love it to become a, a musical on Broadway, uh, but Hollywood is a complicated place. And so uh, we're trying to unravel, you know, all the difficulties that, that are legally attached to it. But in any case, uh, it became a movie and, uh, and it's connected to Zuzu in that sense. Uh, the story behind it, I'm sure if you've seen the movie, you, it, that's the story. There was no book, there was no book, there were no articles, there was nothing that I had to go on as a guide. So I did have Connie Valenzuela, Richie's mother, and, and, and Bob Morales, uh, Richie's brother, as uh, witnesses, so to speak. And so I interviewed them on videotape. I wanted to get their expressions. Asked them to tell me the story of, of, their, of, of Richie. I, I also interviewed uh, Bob Keane, Richie's agent, and I interviewed Donna Ludwig of uh, O'Donna. No. Okay, Donna Ludwig Fox. I interviewed her. She was looking good, actually, for her age. And, uh, and so the four of them became the four, corner, the four corners of, of my story. And I, I had to use everything that they gave me because that's all there was. And it, it, it went in shaping uh, La Bamba as a movie. Now, uh, you heard actually discussion uh, uh, in the Field Surprise winning playwright you know, this afternoon, Imar. Uh, Ifar, Imar, what is it? Uh, uh, yeah, there, that, that him, yeah, that's him, I had. Uh, he mentioned about his uh, writing for the screen and stuff and how that has influenced him. As someone who has become a filmmaker over the years, and, and we started a long time ago, believe me, on, on film. Um, I, I think it's a very interesting interplay between writing for the stage and writing for film or for television. They tend to influence each other. And uh, I've gone from the most broad kind of theater that you can imagine, which are the actors. Uh, someone in Europe once said, seeing the performance of the Teatro Campesino is like being at the birth of Comedia del Arte. And that's absolutely true, because our audiences were people that had never seen theater. And, and you know what it's like when you meet someone? I, just, I mean, I was an organizer, you know, when I was a serious, threatening organizer. <laughs> people thought, I, you know, I, I was dangerous, you know. But I, I get up there as, a, as, a, as an organizer, and suddenly I'm doing this, <laughs> you know, at you. <laughs> and some of the men, the says, what's the matter with you? You've got nuts. <laughs> you know. So, uh, you know, in Mexico, if you're an actor, I mean, there's, you're suspect. Your sexuality is suspect to begin with, immediately. Uh, you're, you're either homosexual or you're a lecher, you know, one of the two. Uh, but you're also kind of crazy, you know? So. We had to break through that, and the only way that the campesinos could understand what we were doing is they called us El Circo. <laughs> I get El Circo, you know what I mean? The circus, which made us clowns. So the actors of El Teatro Campesino were payasos. And because we were payasos, it was real hard to get women involved. Again, we might be lechers, but we were certainly payasos, you know? So their parents and husbands and boyfriends 